Okay, good. So, uh, as I mentioned before, now that we have learned about Deutsch, the Deutsch Dose algorithm, I would now like to show you how to implement that with Cascade. So, um, I've prepared some code, but I will go slowly through that. The first cell is just some imports, we import numpy again, we import some Cascade functions that we need. We also need to um, load our IBM Q account. So if you sign in for the IBM Quantum experience, you need to load your account so that you can work, you can later on use the actual devices. Elisa, could I, I ask you to please zoom in on your screen so that the uh, oh, yeah. text is bigger? Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Yep. OK. So yeah, this is just some imports. And for plotting the histogram, we will do that later as well to see the outputs. So now I'm in the first step, I'm defining my Deutsch Dosa Oracle. So what I do to define the Oracle is first of all, I create a quantum circuit. So I call my quantum circuit Oracle QC and I create it just by saying, okay, I have a quantum, I want to do a quantum circuit on n plus one qubits. Now the reason I have n plus one qubits is I need the n qubits that are the input for the, well, for the function that works on n qubits. But then the plus one comes from the fact that for my oracle, we, I told you before, if we implement the um, face oracle instead of the bit oracle, which we're doing now, we actually do need still need this extra qubit, the qubit that I called y before that is in the minus state in the beginning and in the end. And we still need to add this qubit to act on that one. Because this is how we actually add the y plus f of x will be on this last qubit. So that's why I create not only n qubits, but n plus one qubits. So now I will, the Oracle function, I defined it to have two um, inputs. I can, I, I can, so I can tell the Oracle wh which case I'm looking at, whether I look at the case balanced or the case constant. And I will tell it whether, how many qubits I'm acting on. So that according to that, it creates a quantum circuit given the number of qubits n. So let's first look at the case where I have a balanced function. Now there would be a lot of different ways to create an oracle that gives a balanced function. One could, for example, just say, okay, the first n over two inputs will be, or so from out of my two to the n bit strings, the first ones will all be, if, if I sort them, will all be zero and the others will map to one. In this case, one could also just look at one qubit and say, okay, if this qubit is zero, we will output zero, or if this qubit is one, we'll output one. But this is a bit, I thought it's a bit too easy. So what I'm doing, also easy, is I'm applying a C not gate to on each qubit to the, where well, my target qubit is the one, the Y qubit. And the Y qubit is the last qubit. So it's a qubit N plus one. But since I'm counting from zero on, my first qubit is actually zero, not one. So the last qubit is not N plus one, but the last qubit is the qubit N. Sorry, yep. Yeah. So what I'm doing is for the first N qubits, so the qubits zero to n minus one, I take them all as control qubits and controlling on them, I apply a C naught gate onto the qubit n. So on the last, the n plus one qubit. And uh, in this way, with the, what that means is that when my, depending on how many of my input qubits are one, this will be, this will each time it will flip. Whenever there's a one in my input bit string, I will flip the sign of the, of the y qubit, of the insular qubit. So if I have an even number of ones in my bit string, then I will get the outcome zero in the end. And if I have an odd number, I will get the output one. So in the end, I'm basically just taking the parity of my input bit string. And this make, with that, I'm making sure that half of the outputs, half of the inputs will map to zero and half of the inputs will map to one. But that's, as I mentioned, just one way to have a balanced oracle. A very specific one. Now, in the case where the or oracle is constant, so if the case is constant, then I, well, it can be either zero or one. We know that physically it doesn't make a difference. So one could also just leave out that step, but well, to show it, show the full thing, I'm actually choosing randomly, then I'm taking a random integer zero or one. That will be my, I would call output in the case where it is the output is one. That means that I'm always outputting one. So I will get, I will apply X. I said my F of X will be one. So I, 
I have to flip the ancilla qubit. While in the case where it's zero, I'm not doing the steps, I'm not doing anything, which is exactly if the oracle always outputs zero, then we know there's it's not doing anything, it has no effect. Now, so I've created this quantum circuit, which depending on whether I'm a balance or a constant function, applies some stuff to my ancilla qubit. But what we need to do now is this circuit, because I don't want to later on when I plot it, I do not want it to show me what I'm doing, like show all the C0 gates that I'm applying in the balance case, for example. But what I instead want, I want this whole thing to be a new gate and just to be shown as one gate, as one big block, which I call the oracle. So you will later on in the plot, in the when I plot the quantum circuit, you will see a box called Oracle, which is exactly has all of that inside. And then I return the Oracle gate. So Oracle gate is what I called it here. Oracle is the name that it will display later. And this Oracle gate is then the quantum circuit that I'm returning if I call this function. Now I need a second function where I the, define the actual algorithm. So I'll call it the Deutsch-Schoser algorithm where I input n and the case. And so for I, what I do in the beginning is I'm creating a quantum circuit, again, on n plus 1 qubits. However, here I have n plus 1, comma n. And maybe you've learned that from yesterday already in the if you did the labs or if you had a look at Qiskit already. So the first number, if I before I only had one number here, which means I just create n plus 1 qubits. Now, in this case, I'm creating n plus 1 qubits and n classical bits. The classical bits I will need later to store my measurement outcomes. So if I do a measurement, I need to connect some qubits to some classical output so that I can later on read, read out the classical output bits. So, I, But I do not need n plus 1 because the ancilla qubit I never measure. I never care about that one, right? I just need it to construct the oracle, but then in the end, I only have n output bits that I'm measuring. So. Now I'm going with, um, I look at all my n qubits. And on each of the n qubits, I apply the Hadamard gate in the beginning, because that's what we do in the first step of the deutsch schoser algorithm, right? If you look at the circuit here, we have first, we start in state 0 by default. Then we apply the Hadamard gates to all of them, which is what I'm doing here, Hadamard gate on every qubit. Then I'm, well, I, want, I need, still need to, um, set up my additional qubit, the n plus ones, the, the qubit n plus one, which is the qubit n because we're counting from zero, right? So on this one, I want to prepare the minus state, as you learned. We said we want, and we want to have the minus state. And the minus state I can, for example, create by first applying the x gate. So I'm getting from zero to one. And then if I apply the Hadamard gate to that qubit from one, it brings me to the minus state. So now I've created the minus state on the ancilla qubit and the Hadamard gate on all my n qubits. And now maybe you have noticed that here I'll put in case equal random. So that's a Python feature. If I create a function and I give it, I have some uh, variables that I put in. So in this case, I have the variable n and the variable case. If I later on call this function, I need to give a variable n. And this, because I already set a, I set a default value, and I don't need to give something. I can specify it. If I don't want the case random, for example, if I want a different case, if I want it to be balanced, I can put in case equal to balanced. But I can also just not put anything here, and then it will, by default, take this case. So the case would then be random. And now, so I wanted to just test that case. I have the case random as well, where it just randomly chooses whether I have constant or balanced. So if the case is random, then I'm choosing my variable <laughs> random, which is an integer out of one of two integers, so either 0 or 1. If it is 0, I choose the case to be constant. If it's not 0, so if it's 1, then I choose the case to be balanced. That's just an additional feature. And so now I call my oracle. So I define oracle as the function that I have. I, I'm calling the function that I defined before. The Deutsch Schoser Oracle, that's the function we had in the last cell that we had up here. And this gives me back a circuit. So Oracle is now the Oracle circuit that we defined earlier. And the circuit I append to the circuit that I already created, because I already created this circuit here with the n plus 1 qubits and the Hadamard gates and the minus state prepared. And now I add the 
So it shows our Oracle to that circuit. We have to specify that so the to the circuit Deutsch shows a circuit, I append the Oracle circuit and I append it on the n plus one qubits. Okay, so now I'm what I have, if I look at this, I have my state zero, I applied the Hadamard gates, I applied the unit, the Oracle UF. Now what I need to do is to apply again Hadamard gates. So um, for all qubits. And then after applying the Hadamard gates, I want to measure each qubit. So now I'm doing a loop over all n qubits, just the n qubits. I do not care about the last qubit. And for each of these qubits, I have my circuit dot h on the, and then i, so i on the ith qubit, because I'm going from i goes from 0 to n minus 1. So I'm applying a Hadamard gate on each qubit, and then I do the measurement. For the measurement, I have to specify the qubit that I'm measuring, qubit i, for all the different i's. And then the second one is the classical bit on which it will be stored. When I told you before, when I created the quantum circuit, I have here my n bits, classical bits on which it's stored. So here in this case, I will store it on my ith bit, classical bit. And then I return the circuit. So if I now call this function deutsch joser algorithm, I will, it will return me the hopeful deutsch joser circuit. Okay, now I need to run actually both cells, run this cell and run this cell. And now I can call it. So for example, we can say n equal to four. And then my deutsch joser circuit is, I'm calling the deutsch joser algorithm. And then I want to draw it. So let's see. Now here we can see we have our four first qubits on which we just apply the Hadamard gate. And the fifth qubit, which is called Q4, is the one where we prepare the minus state. We apply the oracle to all of it, which is, as I told you, just one box now that says oracle. So you actually don't know whether it's constant or balanced. It's just this black box. Then we have again the Hadamard, the four qubits, and the measurements. Well, now we want to see what it actually does. So we want to see what happens if we run it on a device or first before before we run it on the actual device, let's run it on the simulator. So as a backend, I first, I will now choose the simulator. And I choose 1024 shots, which for the simulator doesn't make a difference because it's exact anyway. We won't have any noise, I mean, but then for later, later on, if we run it on the actual device, it's important to have a higher shot number so that we see the probability distribution. Then I'm calling my, I'm creating my circuit by calling this function that I said before. And for example, now I could say n on n qubits, n I defined to be four before, and I can say I want it to be constant. Then I execute the circuit by just saying execute. Then I give the circuit that I want to execute. I specify the back end and I specify the number of shots. That means that I'm executing the whole thing. And if I do dot result, then I'm getting all the results. The results have a lot of different features though, but what I'm actually interested in right now is just to get the number of counts. So I say results dot get counts to then get a different get all the different counts for the different states that I'm measuring in the end, the different bit strings. And I do plot histogram to see a histogram of the number of counts. So if you run that, well, this should not be surprising. We see that the probability is one to measure the state zero, 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 which is exactly what we said. We, because we, what we would expect, because we gave, we said it should be constant. And if it's constant, we determined before that then the probability to measure the zero string, bit string is one. So if we now choose balanced, then we have probability, probability one, but for a different bit string. We do not have the bit string zero anymore. In theory, we could have any other bit string. However, the way that I designed the Oracle, we would always get this bit string for that, for that Oracle. But it depends on how I'm designing the balanced Oracle. In this case, it's that bit string. Um, yeah, and so if we, I told you before, if I, not put, if I won't put anything in here, it will take the, by default the random. So it would just randomly choose now we get, for example, now it would be balanced. And again, balanced and constant. So it just yeah, takes random outputs. Now we did it on the simulator. 
And I think you all know that we can also on IBM, on the IBM quantum experience, use actually do our jobs, run them on actual quantum computers. So I hope the yeah, queues are not too busy now. Let's see. What I'm going to do is because if you log into the IBM quantum experience, you will see on the right side all the different devices that you can run jobs on. But you see some of them, for example, have a very long queue. You can see here that's 22 jobs in it, while some others are empty. OK, I'm not, I did not refresh the page, so that might it was five minutes ago. But so we have some, oh, no, it actually does. Oh, OK, we can see the number is increasing here. So we can see that some devices are more busy than others. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, give me the least busy backend. And then I'm going to run it already now, so it can be executed in the background. Now I have to zoom out a bit so we can. Because so in addition to giving me the least busy backend, where here, by the way, I had to specify also that the number of qubits should be at least n plus 1, so that I'm not getting the, otherwise I might get the device that has only one qubit. That would not be helpful for me. We cannot run it there. So I want to have a device that has at least n plus 1 qubits. And then I'm taking the least busy one. I'm running the circuit. I'm calling the circuit, the, the, the function deutsch Rosa algorithm. I'm running it on the backend, whichever is the least busy backend. With the number of shots I specified before, it was 1,024. And in addition to what I, to the simulator, I'm now adding the optimization level. So I'm putting here optimization level equal to three, which is the highest number that you can have, which means that the device automatically tries to choose on the map, choose, for example, the map in a way that um, my qubits are connected. Because you saw I'm applying a lot of C0 gates, but then it's better if the if you apply the C0 gates to qubits that are actually connected, because of course not all qubits are connected. If I go back here, and I'm for example looking at one of these devices, you can see in this case we would have zero and one are connected, one and two are connected, but for example, two and four are not connected. And if I have to apply a C0 gate on two and four, this gets the, this will have much many more errors because I have to like do swaps between all the other qubits in between. So Having the optimization level will, for example, optimize for the map, but then also it will optimize for some gates if you can simplify them, for example. So here we see least busy backend is Burlington, which is actually what we saw here before as well. And then I also have the Kiskit Job Watcher, which is a feature that I like a lot, which gives me this, makes this thing here pop up in the corner. That's why I had to zoom out. So we see here we have this box. I can click on that. And now I see, oh, it's actually my job is already done. My job has successful run. Otherwise, I would see where in the queue I am. I would see my queue position. So I can see, uh, get an idea of how much longer it's going to take until my job is run. And so once the job is run, I can, as before, get the results and then get the counts of the results and then plot the histogram. So let's do that. Oh, and we see this case. <laughs> so what it tells us is we have. 37.5% to chance to measure the string 1111. While we only have 0 0.06%. Well, as it, one, as it looks very different from what we had on the simulator, where the reason is that we, of course, now have a lot of noise. And also, the, we can see that this number here is quite small, but we can still identify immediately that this is the, out, the outcome that we wanted. But that's why it's so important that we have a high number of shots, because let's say I'm only doing one shot. The probability would not even be would be even smaller than one half that I'm getting this state, and I might just get any other state, and I would not have a clue whether that was correct or not. Well, if I'm getting doing a lot of shots, I can get an impression of what the actual state is that I wanted to measure, which in this case is one 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 one. So we know in this case now the function was balanced. And now I actually because I wasn't sure how long I might need to wait in the queue, so I ran some jobs before, and what I want to show you now is. You can see um, here, for example, we had very similar, OK, a bit higher, but also like 56% chance to measure the 11111 string. That was for the balance function. However, when I'm looking at the constant function, I'm getting 93% with 93% chance the right outcome, which is, of course, much, much, much higher than what we saw before. So here, the fidelity to get the right outcome is super high. 
And well, the reason why this is the case is that for, in this case, I had the constant function, which means that my Oracle, we said my Oracle actually doesn't do anything, right? It just, it might apply the X gates, but it, uh, uh, but only on this, uh, it will not have any effect. So also, so then if we simplify, it might not even do anything. So we know that we saw that the Oracle will not have an effect in the case where we have the constant function, while in the case where we have the balanced function, it will apply all these C0 gates between all the qubits. And applying multiple C0 gates causes a lot of uh, noise. That's why we have a smaller success probability for the other case. But yeah, um, that's it for the Qiskit implementation with Virtuosa. Maybe now I could take some more questions and start screen sharing. Uh, before then, going to the Rova algorithm. Sure thing. So I was looking through, I encourage people in the chat, if you had a question about Qiskit itself, this would be a great time to ask a question about Qiskit. Uh, we haven't seen any of those questions get very high ranked yet. So one question that's been lingering for a lot of today's lecture is the mapping of the oracle mentioned in today's lecture the only form of arbitrary mapping from uh, x to y to x to, uh, y plus f of x and if so why i yeah. am not sure i'm understanding the question fully because i don't know what arbitrary mapping what, what they mean with that um so well here's one option we have um this user uh, we yes. can invite them on screen and have them explain it. Uh, so let's see, this is from Abhishek. If you are currently active in Crowdcast and you are able to jump on and let us know what your question is, please let us know in the chat right now. We'll give you about five seconds. If you're in the chat, let us know. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll hold on to that one for later. Well, I guess, I mean, otherwise, like someone answered there, it's not the case that any arbitrary unitary takes the form, which is of course right. I'm not sure whether this is, answers the question though, whether this was what the person asking the question meant. Yeah, of I'm course, not every unitary takes that form. That is indeed just something that helps us to, that's our way to perform the Oracle to make it reversible. Um, yeah, so we'll hold yeah. on to that. Or we'll uh, mark Sorry. that one as done for now. We didn't hear from the person writing it. Uh, and we'll, I think, go back to your lecture for now. Grab some more questions later. Okay, sure. Then we will now continue with Robust algorithm. Hmm. So this algorithm is <laughs> famous to be an algorithm that is searching an unsorted database. <laughs> and I'm now putting this in exclamation marks uh, because uh, so uh, as I told you before, searching an unsorted database is something that we actually do not really see as a very uh, good feature. Like it's not very feasible to search an unsorted database because one would need to first in, read in all the, the the full database in order to apply it then. Or at least it's not clear how else one would design the oracles as the, such that the oracle itself does not take longer than the full algorithm when, classic, when classically implemented. However, as I said before, one can uh, still have useful applications with that. So first of all, it's, so we're looking at, we def, again de define n to be two to the power n elements. And now the good thing is, in this case, it can do it in square root of n time, which by the way, is the first algorithm where it's proven that it's faster than, than a classical algorithm. But so instead of calling it searching an unsorted database, what I would rather say is that we can find an x such that f of x equals one. So this phone book thing, what people refer a lot to when they talk about Grover's algorithm is, okay, yes, that is the correct name, or no, that is not the correct name. But as I said, we this function f might more be like, yes, all the 
mathematical Boolean uh, restrictions that you pose, imposed are correct or no, they're not correct. But yeah, so anyway, this is yeah the search algorithm. And if we compare it to a classical algorithm, a classical algorithm needs on average, and now you can think about it, if I give you n names and I want you, and I'm wondering to which belongs the phone number, then you can tell classically, you just go through one after the other, and on average, you will need n over two time. So it scales with n. So in this case, we do not have an exponential advantage because we need, with a classical, uh, with a quantum algorithm, we need square root of n time, while with a classical algorithm, we need n time or of n time. Um, but we do have a polynomial advantage, and this one was actually proven. Like for other algorithms, it's more that we cannot find, for example, for the ones where we have an exponential ad advantage, we, we have an exponential advantage compared to the best known classical algorithm, but it's not clear whether there would be a, an even better classical algorithm. Well, in this case, we know that we can prove that there's no better classical algorithm. So let's define the goal again mathematically. So the goal is we want to find our winning element W given some oracle uf, which implements the function f that has n input bits and outputs either 0 or 1. And we define f of x such that it outputs 1 if x is the winning element and 0 if not. So as I said, the winning element can be the name that corresponds to the phone number, but can also be the element that satisfies all constraints. And then we actually also will need another function, which I call f0 of x, which is very similar, but it does not even depend on w. So it just outputs 0 in the case where we input the bit, the, the zero bit string, and it outputs one in any other case. So remember that uf, the action of uf, was that if we apply uf on x, it will give us minus one to the power f of x times x. So if we now define our function uf, and we wanted to map w to minus w because well, well it should get the minus one in this case and then we every other element x it should then output uh, map to x because it should we just have minus one to the power zero right? for all x that are not w and the way we can write this as a unitary is by taking identity minus two times the projection onto W. And one can very easily see that this is correct because if we apply UF now onto the element W, we will get identity times W, which gives us the state W minus two times. The projection onto W is just one, so minus two times W. So we get minus w, which is exactly what we wanted. If we, however, apply it to if we apply to some state x that is orthogonal to w, then the projection onto x, so that is the second part, will be zero, and we will just have identity times x. So we just get the state x, which does exactly what we want. Now, analogously, we can do the same for the function u f zero, where we have the input state zero to the power n which it should map to zero to the power n. And x, it should map to minus x for all x that are not the zero bit string. And then we can see that in this case, the unitary just as before, this time just the opposite way, we can write it as two times the projector onto the zero bit string minus identity. Okay, now let me give you the quantum circuit for a global algorithm. And then similar as before, we will go through every single step. It's gonna be uh, some calculation, but in this case, 
I will give you a very illustrative way to describe it, which I think is very nice to see how robust algorithm works. Mm. But yeah, let's start with a quantum circuit. So we again start in the state zero on all qubits. And you might guess that in the first step, we apply Hadama gates to all qubits. And then in the second step, we apply our Oracle UF. Then we have another round of Hadamard gates. So this is so far, it's just like the deutsch joseph algorithm. <laughs> then we apply the other oracle, the one that corresponds to UF0. Another round of Hadamard gates. And finally, some measurements. And then the classical outputs that I'm getting, I will call it the bit string Y, which is some bit string on n bits. Now, all the part that I have in purple here is what we call the diffuser. You will later see the effect of that, and I call it V. And now, actually, I did not, this is not the whole algorithm, but what we do is we apply both uf and v, we repeat it r times, where we'll specify what r is later. So we have the Hadamard gates, then u, v, u, v, u, v, r times, and then the measurement. Now, the claim is that y, the output bits, equals w, with a high probability, and the high probability we can, will also specify later how high that probability is. It's increasing with n. So we're going to prove this now. For that, we will first define the uniform superposition state. which is the state where we have when we have just what we have after applying Hadamard gates to all our zero qubits. So it's just the equal superposition. You know that by now, we will just get the equal superposition of all two to the n states. And this we call S. And then what we also define, I already wrote that down though, is we define V to be H to the power N times U of zero times H to the power N. And this we can even simplify a bit because we know that we just wrote down before this, how we can write the unitary as a projection onto zero minus identity. So we will now Write that in two terms. Here we have two times projection onto zero to the power n and then h to the power n minus, and now we have times the identity. And times identity does not do anything, so we can just cancel that. And now what we know is that if we apply here in the first case, we can get the two out to the front, and then we have h the power n on zero, which is exactly s. And then the, on the other side, we have, the, so we have bra and cat, or cat and bra s. This is just from both sides, we get the superposition state minus, and then here we have Hadama times Hadama, which is identity as well. So V simplifies to just be two times s minus identity two times projection onto S minus identity. So Grover's algorithm what it in the end does is it carries out 
the operation v times uf0, oh, sorry, v times uf to the power r on the state s. So we initialize basically with the state s because we have zero and apply all the other mass. Then we apply r times uf and v, and then we do the measurement. Now, maybe it's confusing why I'm writing v times u and not u times v. This is because if I have my state 0 and I apply a gate a, then the state I'm getting here is a times 0. If I'm applying then another gate b, I'm getting b times a times 0. Here. So oh, let me just write it like this b times a times 0. So if I'm first applying uf and then v, I have to put the v to the left and the uf then to the right. Yeah. OK. Now, let sigma, last thing that we define now, be the plane. We need that one to illustrate everything nicely then. So we define sigma to be the plane that is spent by our states S and W, W the winning element, S the superposition state. And then we, okay, sorry, we define another thing. We define W orthogonal to be the state that is orthogonal to W. but lies in this plane, because there's infinitely many states that are orthogonal to W, but I want to have the state orthogonal to W that lies in this plane, so that I can write it nicely as a linear combination. You will see that now. So then I have also omega orthogonal. You can define it as one over square root of two to the n minus one. That's my normalization because I want to have, you know, I want it to be in the plane with the superposition state and the state x. So what I want is the state, the superposition of all states x, except for when it is the except for w. So superposition of all possible true to the n bit strings, but not w because it has to be orthogonal to w, which is now is, and then the author, uh, the that's why the normalization factor is two to the n minus one because we have only two to the n minus one terms in the sum for the x now. Given this, I can rewrite s in terms of just w orthogonal and w, because it lays in the same plane. So I can just write it as two to the n minus one over two to the n. So this is just so that I'm getting the one over two to the n Vectors, vector for every state, one over square root of two to the n, plus, and then here I have one over square root of two to the n times omega. And I mean, I think you can see now if I sum these two up, I will get just the equal superposition of all states. And to simplify it in the illustrations, I define my now some angles theta such that I can write it this way. So what I did is I defined theta such that sinus of theta over two equals one over square root of two to the n. And then we know that sinus squared equals one minus cosine squared. So sine squared, if I have sine squared to be that, the other part has to be cosine squared. So, and we also know then that that means that theta is actually two times arc sine of one over square root of two to the n. Good, sorry, there was a lot of math now, but let's see how the protocol works. Let's plot that especially. So here I'm going to plot our plane 
sigma. The plane sigma is the one that is in which we have omega, the winning element. And we also have omega orthogonal now, which is orthogonal to omega in the same plane. And in the same plane, we also have our superposition state S. And we know by the definition that we just made that this angle here is theta over two. So we know S is very close to omega orthogonal because S is the superposition of all states, while omega, uh, well, well, W or omega, well, I think I mix it up, calling it sometimes omega and sometimes W. Let's say W orthogonal is um, the superposition of all states except for X. So it's the superposition state is much closer to W orthogonal than to W. So in the first step, we just prepare the state S. So we just get, we apply these Hadamard gates and then we have zero and applied Hadamard gates and then we know where the green, where the green arrow is. Then in the second step, we apply, yeah, if I go back to the quantum circuit, we saw we first have, the first step we have, we apply, we prepare the state S by applying the Hadamard gates. Then we have UF and then V. So now we apply in the second step uf, which is given by identity minus two times the projection onto w. Now, what does that mean? If I'm projecting, if I do take, if, if I apply identity minus two times projection onto w. So identity means I'm basically starting at where I ended before. So starting up here and now minus two times going into the direction of, because of minus two, into the direction of minus W and the projection onto W. So the projection of the element that I'm just having, I'm, I'm here, I project it onto W. So I'm getting this, this is basically the projection. And now I'm going minus two times into the direction W. So minus two means this, and then this, so I'm ending up here. This is my state uf times s. And this angle, no, I did not plot it very nicely, but it has to be also theta over two. So what step two corresponds to is a reflection at w orthogonal. Then let's look at the third step. In the third step, we apply V. V, we noticed we can write V as two times the projection onto S minus identity. And similar to how I just showed you that step two is a reflection at W orthogonal, we can show that applying V is just a reflection at S. So reflecting, we have here an angle from, we're at the orange, at the end of the orange, we're here. So we have an angle theta to the state S. So if we reflect, we go up by another angle theta here. So here we have V times UF times S. What that means is that if we apply V times UF, then this corresponds to a rotation by an angle theta. Because we see we were before, after step one, we had the angle theta over two, and now we got another angle theta to that state. Which means that if I have because you know, in this in the quantum circuit, I told you we're not only applying it once, but we're actually applying it r times. So if I have r applications of step two and step three, then the state is rotated by r times theta. Yeah, I think that makes sense. 
one rotation corresponds to theta, so our applications correspond to a rotation by r times theta. So now the question is, how do we choose r? We want to choose r in a way such that if we apply, if we do r rotations, so we move by r times theta, plus the initial angle that we had, which was theta over 2, because we started in the green state before, in s, that should give us, or it should be at least very close to, the angle 90 degrees, this angle here, which is pi over 2. Okay, so if we, re and we can now solve this for r, and then we get that r equals pi over 2, sorry, pi over 2 theta, minus 1 half. And now the question is, what is theta? Well, we have defined theta here. It depends on the number of qubits that we had. So we have theta equals 2 times arc sine of 1 over square root of 2 to the n. So if we put that in here, we have pi over 4 times arc sine 1 over 2 to the power n square root, and then minus 1 half. If n is large, then we, we are interested now, especially then the arc sine will be similar, will be very close to the, just, so arc sine of x will just be x, basically. So we can write pi over 4 times square root of 2 to the power n, and we don't even care about the factor of 1 half then anymore, because we just want to see how it scales. And this scales as square root of n. So with this, we showed that it actually scales as square root of n. Now the question is, the problem is, this r that I just determined, in general, it will not be an integer, right? It will not be, it will not tell me that I have to do five rotations, but it will tell me that I have to do 5.3 rotations, for example. So then I will not be exactly on W, but I will be, for example, here. And if I'm here, I still have a small probability if I do a measurement to measure some state that is orthogonal to W. And I have a high, very high probability to measure W. But now the question is, what is the probability? So if I apply R, if I do R calls to the Oracle, and then do the final measurement. And this will result in the state W with a minimal probability. And now we know, so the probability to measure W, let's look what is the, what at the worst case to determine the minimum probability. In the worst case, because we always rotate by theta over, by, by theta every time we, or if we increase r by one, we will do another rotation by theta. So the worst case is the case where we have here w, and here we have w orthogonal. And in the worst case, we end in a state here, such that this angle is theta over two. If it's smaller, it's even better. If it's larger, we will just apply another round and then be here on this side, but still be closer than theta over two. So in the worst case, our angle in the end will still be theta over two. If we have theta over two here, the probability to measure the state in a state that is not orthogonal to, that, that is not W, is sine squared of theta over two. Actually, the probability to measure state w or state yeah state w is cosine squared of that angle, so cosine squared of theta over two. So we have one minus sine squared of theta over two to measure that. The reason I'm writing it with a sine and not with a cosine is because we know that sine of sine squared of theta over two, if we go up here, that's how we defined one over square root of two to the n. So now if we square it, we just have one minus 
1 over 2 to the n. So with a probability of at least 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n, we will get the right outcome. So if we have, if our n is high enough, we will get a, have a really high probability to measure the right outcome. And this is even, the, also this is the worst probability. We might even be luckier and get closer numbers, get better numbers than that, as we will see in the examples that we will do with Qiskit in the next hour. So I think now it's a good time to have another one or two questions and then have another 10 minute break. All right, so diving into the questions here. Um, seems that many of these questions have been hanging out for a big part of today's lecture. So just, just getting through them. Uh, the first question I believe is already answered um, is the Dutch Joza algorithm used for search algorithms basically? I believe the answer there is yes, correct? No, the Deutsch Josa algorithm is, no, the Grover algorithm is the one that is the search algorithm. The uh, Deutsch Josa algorithm is the one that can tell us whether a function is constant or balanced. And I do not see why this would help for search algorithms. Perfect. Thank um, you for the answer. <laughs> uh, another question, uh, just going down a little bit here. We had a few people ask about the oracle itself. Uh, asking if the oracle is similar to a Turing machine or Turing's machine oracles. Um, well, in our case, the oracle would need to be able to also um, act on quantum states. So it would need to have be able to process superposition state, which the Turing machine oracle cannot do. So you would need to it is not like a classical oracle, but a, that's why we have, a, we have a unitary, which can not only process classical states, but it can also process states in uh, superposition, quantum states. So it's different. 